Um, now, before I hand over to the panelists, I would like to do a quick exercise uh, with you. And I would like to do uh, a kind of a poll with three questions. Um, so get uh, perhaps your smartphone ready or use your uh, uh, Internet Explorer to, uh, to join. Um, and I think you could see this as uh, an appetizer for uh, the discussion uh, later on. So I will share my screen now quickly. And on the screen, you see the QR code. You can scan the QR code with your phone. It takes you to uh, this uh, website here, uh, go.bath.ac.uk slash TPV. And um, it uh, asks you for a session ID, which is a uh, river, which you can see here on uh, the screen. Um, when you have entered that, uh, you probably are asked for uh, your name and email address. You can skip that. You just press the button join. And uh, because we are going to do uh, this polling uh, anonymously. Um, and then uh, there are three questions. And for each question, uh, there are 30 seconds where you can press your uh, choice. Uh, just one choice is a multiple choice uh, question. And we will see the results of the question immediately on, uh, on the screen. So if everyone is ready, we can go to the first question now. And I need to do that. Let me check where that is here. So we go to the first question and polling is open now. The question is, what is the most important characteristic of a good water quality? And of course, that is in a river. Uh, and there are four options clarity and turbidity, uh, people swimming in the water, uh, salmon and trout present in the river, or undisturbed conditions for the ecosystem. And there are still 12 seconds to go, 10. OK, and I think that was the end of this uh, first poll. We can see that the majority of us well, think that uh, answer D, uh, undisturbed conditions of the ecosystem and hydrological regime is uh, the, 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 the right uh, answer to this. And actually, this is the description how it is uh, formulated, I think, in uh, the Water Framework uh, Directive. Um, let's go to the second question. Um, what do you consider the most important uh, pollutant in uh, rivers? Nutrients, organic material, pesticides and herbicides, pharmaceuticals or persistent and mobile compounds? OK. Good. That was the, third, the, the second 30 seconds. So we can see here that nutrients are important, uh, considered important by many of us, and also pesticides and uh, herbicides. Uh, but also the other uh, categories uh, seem to uh, get some, uh, some scores uh, here. And actually, I would think that all of these components are, of course, important in relation to uh, our river water quality. Now, let's go to the third question. Um, what do you consider as the most important abatement option for water quality? Source control, regulation, wastewater treatment, a holistic approach, which includes all of that. Or we can also say that measures are too costly and poor quality is acceptable. OK. Okay, I think, yeah, we're out of time now. And um, yeah, I think we see here that the holistic approach, uh, of course, scores high and also source control and prevention scores high. Um, I think that is uh, really what we would like uh, to see. Um, although I think uh, things like uh, treatment uh, options uh, probably will still be needed also in, in terms of a holistic uh, approach. So thank you very much for um, this uh, poll and the information uh, you have given uh, here. Um, 
what I would like to do uh, is now uh, head up, uh, perhaps these uh, questions will come back at the end of the session. We can uh, try to, uh, to discuss them a little bit further. But if you, before we go into the real discussion, um, I would like to hand over now to uh, Dr. Rose O'Neill. So Dr. Rose, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Jan, and thank you to the IPR for inviting me today. Uh, Sophie, are you able to share my slides? Wonderful. Okay, can, is that is that all working? Can you go to that? Go back one, please, um, Sophie. Thank you very much. So, I'm a social scientist at Natural England, but I love rivers. And I'm really interested in how society and how we as individuals um, value rivers and how we can change our behaviours to um, protect and restore them. And I wanted to start my talk today with my local river. So this is uh, a bit of the River Wallington down in southeast Hampshire. And um, it's a flashy, uh, mostly culverted, partly concrete um, river. The water quality is not great. It's hard to get to. There's nowhere that you can actually walk along it. You have to sort of cross it. But still, this morning on my lockdown walk, it gave me a moment to connect with nature, to watch the wagtails, to, to listen to the sound of the raindrops um, splashing into the water. And it just gave me a moment of calm I let it wash over me before I head, headed back home to deal with the sort of hectic reality of the madness of, of working and, and homeschooling at the same time. And if you can go to the next slide, please, Sophie. So rivers have played a, a real starring role in our lockdown for our family. They've been a real chance for us to get away, relax, explore and learn and exercise. So this river, the Mion, which is a, a, another local little chalk stream for me. Um, it's, it's my children's favourite. They absolutely love getting their nets out and doing a kick sample and, and looking for caddis fly cases. And uh, if we're lucky, we might find a bullhead. Um, and so this has been, you know, it's been a really part um, of our lockdown, but we're not alone in this. Um, Natural England run a uh, people and nature survey which explores um, how we, how the adults in England um, engage and um, experience the natural world. And we've been collecting data since the beginning of lockdown on how and how our behaviours and our experiences have changed. And we know that some parts of the population are getting outside much more. And if we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you'll be able to see here, this graph shows the proportion of adults in England who report spending time by rivers um, or lakes or canals in, in a month. And in, our, in November, um, just last year, um, during the last lockdown, something like a quarter of adults in England uh, reported spending time um, by, by a river. And, and in some of the ways, this is quite surprising. So to give you a bit of context, about a third of adults reported spending time in the countryside and about a third reported spending time in the woods. And so rivers are all not far behind that. And yet rivers are so inaccessible. There's very limited number of places that people can actually go compared to say countryside and woods. Um, and I think this speaks to the, the, the fact that they're a bit of a magnet, that they're, they're incredibly special to so many of us. They're part of our culture. There are so many stories, you know, they're part of our, our imagination. And, and um, during this lockdown, they've, they've been um, a place to connect with nature, to provide a bit of sanctuary. And there's growing scientific evidence about the mental and physical health benefits from spending time in nature. So we know that uh, spending two hours a week um, in the natural environment, um, people that report that, that do that report significantly higher um, outcomes in terms of both mental and physical health. And there's evidence growing again um, that better quality natural environments, so my, more biodiverse places, and blue space in particular, so uh, rivers, lakes, canals, and the coast, um, deliver um, higher um, health, mental and physical health outcomes. Um, and there's a link um, between rivers and our health in other ways. So, um, for example, Wessex Water, um, and maybe Ruth will talk about this later, is uh, pioneering a, a new project, which is 
looking at using uh, social prescribing, so encouraging people to get out into nature as a way of a catchment based approach, um, tackling the problem of chemicals um, set from antidepressants in our water by tackling the project at source by encouraging people to, to get out and connect instead, instead or, or lowering their doses. Um, so I just wanted to start the um, presentation really just by talking about not just the role of rivers and how important they are as ecosystems and to our, our natural biodiversity, which is incredibly important, and also how important they are to our, our water system, our, our taps and our toilets. We, would, we wouldn't be able to function without them, but they're really essential for our health and well-being. And it's about that holistic thinking about the role of rivers in our lives and our society that's really important in terms of water planning. So if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to, <laughs> so I've been uh, doing a lot of homeschooling, maybe like some of you, and um, I, it made me smile when I saw this um, this uh, description and, and picture of a, of a river in one of my son's books. So, you know, it's really here, there's thriving, bubbling, splashing, croaking, glorious, you know, life um, in, our, in our rivers. And it's something that I would just desperately love, uh, you know, our children and, and my grandchildren to, to see. Um, and so Natural England, our mission is around nature recovery. Um, this, this is a big year for nature recovery with the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, Biodiversity and, and also the, the Conference of the Parties for Climate. Um, but I just wanted to say just how important rivers and water are to that um, agenda. A river is so much more than just the water between two banks. It gives life and nourishes the landscape through which it winds. Um, but just as river is, is the lifeblood, it can also be a sump or a drain, you know, a distillation of all of the bad, you know, ways that we treat the land um, in the catchment. And so, so it's almost like a litmus test and the health of our rivers is almost a lit litmus test in terms of the health of the natural world. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is from the WWF Living um, Planet Index, which was published in 2020. And um, given the importance of rivers, um, it's perhaps no surprise that the, the global population of freshwater species um, is declining faster than any other biome. So uh, species such as you know, birds, mammals, amphibians, fish, reptiles have declined, the populations have declined by an average of 84% around the world globally since 1970. And globally, one in three freshwater species is threatened with extinction. And all of the taxonomic groups, there's a higher risk of extinction than in freshwater um, systems compared to terrestrials. And, and that's the global, global picture of our rivers, and that's pretty sober, sobering, but there are parallels in England. So when we look at our triple S size and our uh, special areas of protection, so that um, the jewels in, of the, in the crown, if you like, of our, of our, um, of our nature sites in England, um, you know, the fresh water ones are, are far behind the terrestrial ones in, in terms of their con condition. And that's partly because uh, our rivers and waterways are, are sort of losing out in that sort of rush for water between, you know, we need water in our homes, in our businesses, in our industries, um, but also because we've, we're seeing pollution, pollution from farms, from, from sewage, and, uh, and also, uh, I guess over time, there's been significant ch habitat change. So uh, just one in seven of our rivers is classed at the moment as good ecological status. And um, I think the government targets are for around three quarters of our rivers to be recovered in a natural state. So we've got a long way to go. And it's even more important that we that we um, tackle this, given um, what, what's that the main way that we're likely to feel climate change is through water, both in terms of more intense floods and droughts and extreme weather. If we go into the next slide, I just want to sort of give, give some hope really, which is, uh, you know, there is a lot of activity going on here. There's a lot of organisations, including those um, uh, in this debate tonight, that are really working hard to restore our rivers. So, so this is an example of the work that Wessex Rivers Trust is doing, um, working uh, in rivers to, to improve, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, to renaturalise channels. Um, there are also some brilliant projects um, the, the water companies are leading on uh, uh, and um, yeah that 
which I think what what I'm trying to say here is that you know there's there's lots of actions we know we know what we need to do now we've got the evidence in terms of what we need to do to 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 restore our rivers and, and um, we know what works um, to some extent so it's about scale how do we scale that up and um, one thing that I do find encouraging um, through the people in nature survey we've been tracking uh, the um, public support for for and public concern around um, biodiversity loss and, and environmental damage. And there is still really high level of support there from the public, despite coronavirus, despite the sort of, you know, the focus that has been around health and the economy, environment and climate is still at the forefront of people's minds. So if you go to the next slide, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the social contract between citizens and, and the water company. So um, this is a this is a screenshot of my water bill, um, and I just want you to have a think about what are we paying for when we pay our water bills. Um, I think there's a growing and um, amount of evidence that customers, citizens, are really supportive, and in some cases, you know, demanding even um, that our water companies become move more to a role of being stewards of our of our water environment. I mean, if you think about it, the, the person that's paying a bill, you know, the customer that's the water company customer is also the citizen that is, you know, um, you know wild swimming at the weekend or, or, or taking the dog for a walk along their river. So it's about how, how water companies can really deliver on that social contract for citizens. So taking it beyond that sort of transactional relationship into to something deeper um, around, you know, being stewards and uh, for, our, for our rivers. Um, and just this bill again is just as a little reminder here. I don't know if you can see that my water use in our house, um, with the, between the four of us, is about a third um, higher than it was this time last year. And I think we're at what we call in behavioural science, mo you know, a moment of change. This is a time when our habits, our water using habits, and our practices are have been hugely disruptive our bill is so much higher because we're all here all of the time um and so there's there's so much um in that though in terms of that change it's a moment that we can really have a moment of change for our rivers so lastly i want to just um talk a little bit on the next slide about the descriptor review which um, nick mentioned so in all my experience working in water over the last 15 years or so you know um about how to achieve good status for our rivers the cost of doing so again trading those against the benefits whether people are willing to pay for that and affordability they're always central to the um the debate but um and even in the face of public support to, to increase bills you know it, it's not always the case that that, that that things happen i mean if you think about it of course in the very short term it always costs more to do something than doing nothing but I wanted to leave you with this quote from the descriptor review, which was published yesterday. And, and I was part of the, the sort of internal government team that, that worked on this. And, and we know that water was really at the at key part of the thinking about it. But the question then is, you know, given the threats to climate, the risk to the economy and the huge benefits to our health and, and well-being, can we afford not to restore our rivers? So to sum up on my last um, slide, um, Thank you, Sophie. Um, in conclusion, you know, water is an absolutely fundamental part to our mission to recover nature and rivers are pivotal to our biodiversity, but also our landscapes, our culture and our own health and well-being. And there's huge opportunity here for us to work together with the catchment based approach and the water companies um, alongside um, us uh, regulators. So thank you for listening. And I hope that um, yeah, sets the scene really for the, the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rose. Um, I think my camera is not starting here, so you probably are not uh, able to see me. Um, so thank you very much for this very nice introduction and uh, setting the scene about rivers and how people uh, are uh, well attracted by, uh, by rivers. And I can start my video now. Um, just before I hand over to our next uh, speaker, who is uh, David Dangerfield, I would like to uh, point you to uh, the questions and answers. We already mm -hmm. have one question uh, uh, available now. Um, I will go through the questions later on. Uh, so if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. 
<laughs> and I also would like to point you to the fact that you can use the thumbs up in the question and answer, uh, which will uh, prioritize questions. So if there are uh, two or three or maybe more thumbs up, if you like a question, if you want to ask the same question, um, that will mean that the question will float up to a higher priority and uh, we will uh, address them uh, in the first uh, place. So um, I would like no, now to uh, hand over to uh, Danger, David uh, Dangerfield. David, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to join you this evening, and it's great to um, follow Rose's passionate case for our rivers. So in thinking about this evening, I uh, perhaps inevitably, I guess, reflected on my own time at uh, university in the mid-80s. I um, studied in Sheffield and uh, I must admit as an undergraduate I gave very little thought to the river running through the city. I was aware of it and I often walked over it but in common with many urban areas at the time it didn't really seem to be an asset to the city and its environs largely reflected Sheffield's industrial past. So I am, as you might expect, very fond of Sheffield, and you can imagine my delight to read last September that a steel sculpture of a salmon was being unveiled outside Sheffield Railway Station. As the BBC reported at the time, to celebrate the return of Atlantic salmon after a long-term project to clean up the River Don. Clean up and, I should add, remove barriers to fish passage. Although I was unaware of the sculpture, uh, news of the salmon returning to the River Don came as no surprise because, as the article reported, the salmon's return to Sheffield was a 20-year project by the Environment Agency, the Don Catchments Rivers Trust, the Canal and River Trust, Yorkshire Water and the local authorities. Really good news and evidence of what can be achieved by collaboration and the concerted effort of many people and their organisations. The very next day, however, we, the Environment Agency, announced the 2019 water body classification results. Only 16% of surface water bodies and only 14% of our rivers had met the criteria for good ecological status, the same percentage as the last classification in 2016. Good ecological status is of course our key measure of environmental quality, reflecting a near natural state. But perhaps some encouragement, well, there were 32 fuel water bodies in the poor and bad category, and 77% of individual river water quality tests were at good or better status. Nevertheless, water quality has remained broadly static and some way short of the government's stated ambition of improving at least three quarters of our waters to be close to their natural state. These two events, almost side by side, illustrate both the progress that has been made and the challenges that remain. Water is of course fundamental to life and yet the demands on this vital natural resource increase every day. The climate change, emergency and a growing population put pressure on our water resources and without concerted action we run the risk of harming our environment now and for future generations. Of course we need prosperity and we need food, we need places to live and we need places to work but this does not need to be at the expense of our natural resources. And of course, as others have referred to, only yesterday the government published the Dasgupta review addressing the economics of biodiversity. So what has got better? Well, since 1995, some of the worst pollutants in our rivers have been cut dramatically through regulation and investment in wastewater treatment works, it's estimated that those treatment works discharge 67% less phosphorus and 79% less ammonia into our rivers than they did in 1995. 
And serious water pollution incidents have also been cut by nearly two thirds from 765 in 2002 to 266 in 2019. And these improvements in water quality have had a positive effect on wildlife. Since the 1990s, there has been a big increase in the number of macroinvertebrates in rivers. These small animals, snails, worms, insects are, of course, a key indicator of the improving health of our waters. Many of our historically grossly polluted rivers are also seeing the return of larger animals, another clear indicator of greatly improved water quality. Since 2011, otters have returned to every English county and rivers such as the Tees, the Mersey and of course the Don, grossly polluted 30 years ago, now have salmon back in them. Meanwhile, the quality of bathing waters around our coasts is the best it has ever been. Hard targets enshrined in law have driven improvement. In 2019, for the first time, more than 70% achieved the excellent standard and over 98% met or exceeded the minimum standard to protect health. In 1995, over half would have failed. So th some things have clearly got better, but what remains to be done? Well, despite many years of hard work and nearly 30 billion pounds of investment by the water industry in environmental improvements, as we have seen, only 14% of English rivers meet the criteria for good ecological status. And there has been no significant change in the headline results from the last water body classification in 2016. The most significant cause of failure, as measured by the percentage of water bodies impacted by each pressure, are physical modification, pollution from rural areas and agriculture, and pollution from wastewater, both water industry and private discharges. And let's also acknowledge that some things have got worse. In the last five years, there's been a steady rise in the number of water pollution incidents, from fewer than 6,500 in 2015 to over 7,500 in 2019. The majority of these, again, caused by water company operations and farming. The pollution of our rivers has captured the attention of the public politicians. The very idea of a storm or combined sewer overflow into a river is increasingly seen as outdated and unacceptable. In 2019, storm overflows spilled an average of 35 times each, and nearly one in 10 spilled more than 100 times. Population growth and climate change are likely to make this worse. Solving the storm overflow problem is going to be complex and potentially costly, but the recently announced storm overflow task force represents the collective will of government, regulators and the water companies to find sustainable solutions. Of course, we are all consumers of water and our demand for water is increasing. If no action is taken by 2050, almost three and a half thousand million litres of additional water will be needed for public water supply every day. And yet abstraction from almost 20% of our surface water bodies is already considered unsustainable or potentially unsustainable. And so while we should celebrate the return of salmon to Sheffield, less than 40% of our most precious and internationally important water dependent wildlife sites are achieving their conservation goals. And 10% of our freshwater and wetland species are threatened with extinction. And there are some new challenges, some reflecting improved knowledge and analytical techniques. We now test for more chemicals that accumulate in the biota in our rivers, and we have found elevated levels for some. Now we know about these pressures, we need to deal with them. And public expectation is rising. We've seen the growth of wild swimming, for example, which has led to demands for higher standards of water quality in our rivers. So what can we do? Well, within the, within the EA, our ambition for water is simply to work with others to deliver the objectives of clean and plentiful water as set out in the government's 25 year plan to improve the environment. We will continue to use our evidence to set out the current state of the water environment in England and deliver our core regulatory role.
We will build on our existing programs and policies to maximize wider environmental and social outcomes. Our recently published flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy is an example of this, as is our work with Ofwa and the water companies to develop the Water Industry National Environment Programme, often referred to as WINEP, in support of low carbon nature-based solutions. We will continue to work with government and others to, to agree what can be achieved by existing policy and regulatory mechanisms and identify gaps and opportunities such as the new environmental land management scheme known as ELMS. And we will bring communities and stakeholders together at both a national and local scale, seeking insight, innovation and support while building consensus and behavioural change, something that Rose referred to. As we have seen, much has been achieved in the last 30 years through regulation and investment, improving both standards and compliance. However, many of the pressures on our water environment are from diffuse sources. And so achieving a step change in water quality is therefore a complex, multifaceted challenge, and one that requires everyone to think differently about the way we use water. We must consider together, how can we provide a better water environment? For our part, we will continue to work closely with national stakeholders and local communities to develop those plans. We're currently holding three citizens' juries involving a diverse range of people from the Lower Tyne, the River Wolf, and the Thames Valley catchments to consider the issues together and recommend how we should best respond to the opportunities and challenges of a growing population and a changing climate. This, of course, alongside our current river basin management planning challenges and choices consultation. We are talking to a wide range of people from concerned youngsters through our youth panel to business and industry. All of this will feed into our future water ambition plans and this engagement will be very influential in shaping our future approach. This evening, I very much welcome the opportunity to hear your views. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, yeah, great, uh, great talk um, with very interesting information. And uh, I can see now that uh, a lot of questions are rolling in uh, here now. Um, so I think we have a good uh, uh, start for a discussion uh, later on. Um, the next speaker would be uh, Richard Hicks. Uh, Richard, uh, please uh, take us uh, uh, on your talk. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me, Jan? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Just bear with me a second while I start the slideshow. If you go on the bottom, you can start it. Yeah, that one. Yeah, and then on the top, the display settings, you can swap the screens. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so hopefully um, you can see that. So um, so thank you, Jan, and thank you to the, um, the IPR for the invitation. Great to be here. Really pleased to be here with this, uh, this, this group of speakers. So um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a program manager, so um, my reflections are really from the, the sort of delivery end of the, uh, the, the, the water world and the, how we deliver work in, in catchments. And um, I think a first reflection for me is that um, it seems wherever I go, whatever meeting I'm in, I, I just hear fierce agreement on all aspects, almost all aspects of um, what the issues are um, and how we might be able to solve them. So in terms of the pressures that we um, have on, on the water environment, you know, we know that it's, it's about land use change historically, it's about modification of rivers, um, invasive non-native um, 
species um, and pollution. So we've already heard a bit about uh, diffuse pollution from agriculture and also sewage from uh, water treatment uh, facilities. And uh, David talked about those combined sewage outfalls. So, so we we know what the what the pressures are, and we know the impacts as well. The uh, the top picture there is just uh, a couple of weeks ago at uh, the Dunham Massey Estate. Uh, National Trust and Strait just south of Manchester on the uh, on the River Bolin. Um, and we get agreement from government as well, I think. The, uh, the 25 year plan um, it says all of the right things and it is, you know, is, is telling us the, uh, the ambition that we need around the, the water environment. Um, we, we might argue about some of the targets that are within that and how we're uh, whether we're on course, but actually the ambition within the 25 year plan, I think, I think he's absolutely right. Um, again, David mentioned the uh, challenges and choices consultation, which has recently happened. And uh, some of the things which were coming back from that, people were talking about nature based solutions, working with natural processes, natural flood management, um, a huge shouts around uh, funding. And I'll talk about that, that in a minute. Um, the advice we get from uh, the different agencies, so here from Forest Research, some recent um, advice about the benefits of tree planting and woodland establishment on, uh, fl on flooding. So the, the advice and what everyone's saying seems to be all pointing in the, in the same direction. And uh, we've already had a couple of mentions for this, but uh, yesterday the uh, publication of the Dasgupta review, um, again, say, saying sim similar things, um, and particularly around the economics and how we can make a step change and a, a, a sort of a new paradigm really in, in how we're actually funding our work in the natural environment and the, the big changes that we, we need to get to. So actually designing um, a program of work based on that is not is not so hard really um, and uh, the these are some of the the aims of the the Riverlands program that um, I, I manage um, so it's all about those benefits for for nature it's about doing that with people and uh, Rosie so uh, eloquently talked about how we uh, need need to work with people and the effects that uh, rivers and the wetland environment can have on people. And if we do that together with nature and people, there is a chance that we can build a sustainable future. So in terms of nature, the things we're doing, we, we, we know how to do it, we know what to do, and it's about restoring wildlife habitats. It's about restoring rivers to work with nature again. Um, and it's about across the whole catchment. It's about nature-friendly farming, and land management. So what does that actually look like? Um, this is a, a project in the north of Somerset um, and this is something that has been hailed as uh, innovative and a new approach, first time in this country, um, something that uh, has been coined stage zero river restoration, where you put a river back to how it was um, sort of originally re really. So um, what you're seeing here is a river that was originally in a channel along the woodland edge to the right. Um, and really it's a, it's a come fill exercise where you're taking soil, you're filling up the, uh, the channel which had been created historically. And once again, you're letting water flow over the surface and find its own sort of braided channels sort of forming this uh, anastomized system of, of a river. And in a very short space of time, we have seen huge benefits in terms of the flora and fauna, uh, increased biodiversity, and even anecdotally, the water that is coming out the end of this quite a small piece of restoration, um, the water is a lot cleaner. So it's holding that sediment, it's holding water, it's slowing the flow. But this is, um, I would argue it's not necessarily innovation. This is just putting rivers back to the way they were pre-modification. So this is the sort of thing we need to be doing everywhere. And this is just one, one small example of it. Um, similarly, here's a project in the uh, North, North Wales on the, uh, on the Conwy. The picture you see on your top left 
Um, very familiar site of our rivers, which have been dredged. The soil and the silt has been dumped on the edge of the river to, to contain it. It's lost its connection with the floodplain. And actually putting it right is, is a relatively simple, relatively inexpensive thing to do with a bit of earth moving. Um, and then bottom left, you end up with a river that is reconnected back into its floodplain. Um, and just about a month after this work actually uh, took place, um, this is what happened. Um, and there's, there's something about understanding, I think, what good looks like. And, you know, to me and everyone who worked on this project, this looks really good because it's a river reconnected to its floodplain, allowed to flood out in the time of spate, and so protecting the land downstream. The other area is with, with people. And, and again, I think, we, I think we know what we need to do um, and probably how to do it as well. It's, it's, it's reconnecting people with nature. And, we, and as Rosie has said, we've seen so much of that over the last uh, number, number of months with, with people re really valuing it. Um, it's about engaging with communities um, and it's about access as well. It's, um, so many of our rivers don't have that, uh, that access and giving people opportunity to actually enjoy it. Um, and then the sustainability through that comes from the use of those nature-based solutions um, and that holistic approach, which uh, was one of the questions at the, at the start that uh, came out for the National Trust. It's about us working beyond our boundaries and with the catchment based approach, which is, uh, you know, that holistic approach across a whole catchment. So the, the funding. So um, just a, a, a very quick example of um, how we've reached some funding for, for, the, for this programme of work. Um, some of it is from the Environment Agency in the Lake District and in North Norfolk through grants, the Water Environment Grant. Um, we have uh, some European money, some of the last rounds of uh, European money at uh, Porlock in North Somerset has funded that. Uh, stage zero river restoration. Uh, we have some money from Natural Resources Wales and Welsh Government for the, uh, the work at the Conwy. Um, we've benefited from the recent money that has come from the government to sort of plug the gap of uh, projects which were on hold because of um, financial restrictions due to COVID, so the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Um, we have money from the Natural Lottery Heritage Fund for a project in the, the, the scale. Um, and then we also have a partnership with Yorkshire Water um, and working with the, the, uh, the water industry in, uh, in other places. So, and then our National Trust money we use as a match against this, this different funding. So it's a, it's a great sort of plethora of different places that we're trying to um, secure funding to deliver this critical work. Um, but it's completely unsustainable. And this is um, it's, it's a very simplified model, model this. And um, you know, the, the, the truth of it is we, we do have a slightly more strategic pipeline of work, but often it feels like you apply for funds, you build a team, you deliver the work, you disband the team, you review the work, and then you go around the circle again and apply for funds again. Um, and so completely unsustainable. So that, that model we've been working on for, uh, for some time is, is based on fundraising, it's based on money from the water industry. Um, I think David mentioned WINIP, the Water Industry Natural Environment Program. It's using some of the environment agency funding and we have money from other partners as well. But um, there, is a, there is a new model that seems to be emerging. Um, we've had the Green Recovery Challenge Fund and the government's uh, Nature for Climate Fund, which are, are there to sort of kickstart work back again. And then a lot of the funding at the moment is around innovation. Um, the Environment Agency's Flood and Coastal Resilience Innovation Fund, um, Offwatt's Innovation in Water Challenge Fund. Um, there is another fund called the Investment Readiness Fund. And all of these things, are really pointing towards where we need to be, which, which is a, a new model for how we fund this, this work, um, which may look something like this. 
So um, the environmental land management scheme, which will replace the, the common agricultural policy and will come in in a few, a few years, needs to be the, um, the, the, the sort of foundation really of uh, how we fund our, our work and how we fund far farmers and land use. Um, the uh, water industry has a role to, role to play with, uh, with the WINEP, but there needs to be this really big injection of funding to enable us to meet the challenges of the, the climate and biodiversity crisis. I, I can't stress that enough that actually the um, biz, business as usual and continuing with uh, the trajectory that we have now will not get us to the place that we need to be. So there needs to be a new model. So are we optimistic or are we, uh, are we pessimistic on this? Um, what has to change? And I, I think something does has, have to change. Um, and um, just a very quick reminder of just how important water is to us. We live in a very watery landscape in the UK. These are the catchments across uh, across the countries here that you see. So for me, I think there's two things where we where we need transformational change. And both of them are actually about valuing the water and the aquatic ecosystems. The first is around people and it's people being engaged and really caring for the water environment. Um, and when I say people, I'm not talking to, um, to you people out there. You know, you've joined a webinar on a Wednesday evening. You're, you're already engaged. And I, I expect most of you, are, or not most, but many of you are, are working in, uh, in this, this field. But the, the wider public have got to be really engaged. They've got to understand what, what good looks like and what, where we need to get to and what the issues are. And then we also need this, this new paradigm of the way that we fund our, our work in, uh, in nature. And um, it's interesting, we, did, we didn't collaborate before these, but um, that there is also a quote from the Dasgupta uh, review that was published yesterday. So economies need to be embedded within nature, not external to it. So these two things, I think, to get us to where we need to be, need to have really fundamental transformational change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Just waiting until my video comes on. Yep. Okay, so now you can see me again. Um, thank you very much, uh, Richard, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and showing uh, how uh, we can improve uh, rivers to a natural uh, state. Um, I would like now to hand over to the final uh, speaker for tonight, tonight uh, which is uh, Ruth uh, Barden from Wessex Water. So Ruth, please uh, take us on your journey. Excellent, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen as well, hopefully, if I can find it. There we go. Right. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so yes, very interesting so far. And I don't know whether it's um, an advantage to come to come last or, or not, actually. But uh, some of the um, sort of conversations have obviously already been held, and some of some of the points which I'd like to to make have have been reiter reiterated by others. So that's sort of a great starting point for me. So the the role of the of the water industry, I'm, I think it's probably fair to say I'm talking on behalf of Wessex Water, although obviously many of the themes are quite common. Um, I think it's probably it's also fair to say that actually uh, water and sewage infrastructure has um, had sort of trans trans transformative change in terms of public health in an, an environmental condition over, over the centuries. So starting with our sort of Victorian engineers of Bazalgette and sort of um, obviously uh, Dr. John Snow around sort of understanding cholera, uh, um, the epidemic and sort of the role of, of, of um, water supply with, within that as well, really pioneered the way for many of the water and sewerage systems, um, which we're seeing today and alleviating some of, some of the problems, the gross pollution problems of the, of the sort of great stink back in the, in the Victorian era. 
and that's actually probably a, a, a sort of a, a tradition in some ways which which has carried on with privatization so um, post privatization in 1989 again there's been significant investment in our infrastructure um, as David said earlier, the water industry has invested more than £25 billion in environmental improvements since privatisation. And much of that has been driven by European legislation. So the Urban Waste Water Treatment Directive enabled significant funding or demanded significant improvements um, in, our, in our sewage treatment systems and reduction in, in phosphorus as well. The Bathing Water Directive, again, as mentioned by, by David, um, has has led to huge um, improvements in, in coastal bathing water quality, um, given the, the level of investment that, that has happened, even with the sort of the revision of the directive and tighter standards now. And clearly there's a, an interesting challenge now with um, river bathing waters as well, with the first uh, inland bathing water being designated just before Christmas. Um, and as mentioned, pollution loads from sewage treatment works discharges have, have reduced by 70% in that time. But a lot of these improvements have been revealed through significant civil engineering schemes and Wessex Water has got you know, some examples as well. We've, we've got some big numbers around these as well. So our water supply grid, which was completed in 2018, was a £230 million project um, completed over eight years, which delivered more than 200 kilometres of trunk main to reduce abstractions from the Hampshire Avon catchment, which is a, a, a you know, internationally recognised chalk river. And that reduced our abstractions by 23.5 megalitres per day, which at that time was about 8% of our um, water, which we put into supply. Our North Bristol Relief Sewer, which we're currently constructing at the moment, is £45 million project. It's a six kilometre long, three metre diameter tunnel. And it's actually going to take us two and a half years to, to, to bore that tunnel um, using a, a tunnel boring machine. And that will relieve flooding and enable development in the northern part of the city. Our nitrogen removal plant at, at Pool Sewage Treatment Works was a £12 million scheme completed in 2009 to reduce nitrogen discharges um, into the Pool Harbour Special Area of Protection. So all of these solutions have provided robust and tangible benefits to the water environment. But as one of my colleagues describes them as solutions, they're also climate change accelerators. We pour a huge amount of concrete. We rely on, on chemicals, everything, you know, moving water around and sewage around relies a huge, on a huge amount of pumping. So are we improving the local water environment at the expense of our sort of global um, environment and, and climate with the, with the carbon burden which these um, solutions um, do, do promote? So that's sort of some of the history, the context, where, where, where we are now. And the question is, as we've seen, really, is, well, has that actually had an impact? And I think, you know, as, as, as mentioned by probably every single speaker so far, our watercourses do still face significant challenges. Um, many, many sort of habitats and species are in decline, not just in the freshwater environment, but more widely across the terrestrial environment as well with far, farmland birds um, and, and sort of hedgehogs, things like that, everything which we can sort of relate to. Uh, we, we, we are um, sort of seeing some, some pretty dismal pictures. So how come all of this watering co um, company investment hasn't hasn't necessarily yielded the benefits which you might expect from that level of funding. I think it's probably because there are very complex um, systems out there which, which we haven't quite understood. And also maybe there's a question around delivering in isolation doesn't, doesn't provide um, more holistic benefits. And going forward, actually, some of our challenges are very, very representative of that. So our key challenges at the moment are around storm overflows, around abstraction levels and chalk streams, and also emerging contaminants. And these are complex issues. And actually, some of the solutions, although they might be slightly different, there, there's, there are some themes here. So I guess I'm, I'm sort of probably going to be a little bit challenging myself and a little bit pro provocative. But I mean, can the water industry actually address, address these challenges in isolation? Are we the sole cause and contributor of these problems? And I was you know, really reassured to see that for, for, for the, the poll earlier that Jan um, uh, uh, sort of ran about 3% saw that wastewater treatment was a, was a solution. And actually, I think it was about 61% said holistic uh, um, options are, are, are a better solution and, and actually that's what really what I what I do believe and, and where Wessex Water is sort of looking forward at the moment. So I think you know looking forward the water industry is part of the solution but not the entire solution. 
and storm overflows are a really good sort of example of that. So storm overflows are a massively emotive issue, you know, a lot of media campaigns during um, the last year around calling for cessation of storm overflows. But actually, there are, you know, a few people who really benefit from them, those who who, who suffer from um, internal flooding um, that, and, and external flooding actually really welcome storm overflows because they do offer that release um, mechanism for, for a hydraulically overloaded system. And we need to understand sort of where storm overflows have come from um, to be able to sort of think about some of the solutions. So they are very much a, a legacy of Victorian engineering um, where both foul and surface water are pumped away from or fed by flow by gravity away from our towns and cities for treatment a very high proportion of sort of bath and bristol is served by storm overflows and it's only since the 1960s that separate drainage systems have been required for new housing but it's not always possible to provide that separation due to the distance from water courses or maybe limited land available for suds and alternative systems so there's increasing pressure on these combined systems due to development highway and local drainage um, in, in connections and urban creep and where de developers have the right to connect to the combined system, there's no right to disconnect and no, no authority to do that. So it's very much like your bath at home. You put the plug in, you turn on the taps, and after a certain point, unless you turn off the taps, it will overflow. But who's there to actually turn off the taps in terms of our, our combined sewerage system? So that's one real, really fundamental question for us. Another question is, which, which is possibly sort of missed or maybe less well understood, is actually what is the impact to, on water quality and ecology of storm overflows? We don't really monitor that. And in some locations, actually frequently spilling overflows may not really be a problem. Whereas in other locations, overflows which spill maybe once a year or twice or, or once every two years could have a significant and a prolonged impact. But we're not, we're not monitoring that really at the moment. We've only recently started monitoring how often spill um, overflows operate. Um, we started this about four years ago, and in two years' time, 100% of Wessex Waters overflows will be monitored. So that will tell us when they've stopped, when they start spilling, when they stop spilling, and for how long. There are very few locations where we actually monitor what is the water quality as a result of those overflows. And typically we only monitor for sanitary determinants and nutrients. We don't actually monitor for the emerging contaminants, which are typically picked up um, from, from urban runoff um, and could include, include some quite significant potential pollutants. So where there is a problem, we don't quite know what cause of that is either. So we do need in increased monitoring at a very local level to really understand that and not just invest in improvements due to the frequency of the overflow. It should be the impact that this is causing. But then there are very limited solutions for water companies here. Uh, we do go back to our age old civil engineering solutions. So improving hydraulic capacity, building bigger sewers, building storage, which you can see on, on screen there. That's one of our, um, our storm storage um, Sort of online uh, tanks in, in um, Burnham to reduce the frequency of overflows there. So our solutions are actually climate change accelerators, which are potentially addressing a sort of a manifestation of climate change, which seems a little bit ironic. The alternatives are around disconnection um, of surface water from the sewerage system and also nature-based solutions, so maybe having wetlands. Um, and we do have a couple of examples of those at Hanging Langford working with Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. We've got a reed bed, which um, uh, 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 it's an overflow, which is dominated by um, groundwater ingress through the, the private uh, drainage network, which is actually very successful. It works really well for the local community there who, who have had a reduction in the level of flooding. And also actually the Wildlife Trust are very impressed because it does uh, create a different diversity to the wetland, um, to the habitat which they've got there but these are these can be quite difficult um, and quite location specific as where they where they can be applied it's not a sort of a universal panacea here and also we don't necessarily know how effective they are at the moment in all, all scenarios one of the pictures that you can see on screen there is our wetland at, at Cromwell sewage treatment work so the, the larger part of the of the picture is the is the wetland um, there are I think what is it it's about 12 cells of the wetland there um, 
in the sewage treatment works and we're working very closely with the universities of bath and bristol to understand how effective those wetlands are at removing nutrients um, emerging contaminants and also pathogens um, to understand what what is the application in future moving forward and i think while i've talked about sort of storm overflows similarly you know we the the health of our chalk streams and level of abstraction and also emerging contaminants are these sort of complex systemic societal problems which need to be addressed by by all of us, not just a water company. We need to understand what are the what are the causes of those, whether it's the demand for water or actually our changes in our lifestyle, which mean that we are actually consuming maybe maybe more in different types of pharmaceuticals, which run which um, end up in our water course, even with uh, sewage treatment processes. So I think for 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 water companies, um, it's a new era for us. We we are part of the solution, and some of these are very complex problems which we need to address. And whilst earlier civil engineering schemes may, may have been the solution themselves, they're possibly less so now. Um, they may even contribute to the problem. So our role is definitely more collaborative. We're looking for blended solutions with blended funding. A greater um, resolution of data is required to understand what is the impact at local scale so that we can be, be sure that our customer's money is delivering an environmental solution and not just dressing, addressing an emotive problem. We need to recognise that comp the compromises may need to be made. So, for example, with wetlands, um, they're quite difficult to permit. It's quite difficult for a wetland to maybe achieve a, a one milligram per litre phosphorus permit year round. Yet we need to understand that that wetland will actually create habitat. It will provide additional amenity value and potentially it could be carbon positive. So we need to make compromises to understand that as well, to find the best and most holistic solution for each of those environments and so i'd say sort of in conclusion really whilst the role of the water companies is changing is actually our approach changing people have referred to the water industry national environment program should it just be a national environment program irrespective of who is providing the solution and funding it okay thank you very much thank you uh, ruth um yeah this uh, comes uh, to uh, the point where we would like to uh, to start uh, the discussion and looking at the time um, uh, I think we uh, can take a, a few more uh, minutes uh, today to um, yeah uh, well get uh, through all the questions and we ha actually have quite a lot uh, of questions uh, here in uh, in the Q&A uh, chat I think we are now on the number of 26 questions um, and um, yeah, I think let's just start with uh, with the top one, which has the highest priority, um, and that's a question for uh, David. Um, it's a question from Tom Arnott, and uh, Tom is asking uh, that about uh, the the government uh, austerity uh, policy that uh, mass massively has cut uh, the capacity of the Environment Agency to sample and monitor the, the natural water systems. Does this make the primary regulatory, uh, 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 the, the regulator agency increasingly toothless? So, uh, David, could you have some comments about that? Well, um, so, so my view is, uh, and I think we can reflect on the progress that has been made uh in improving the uh the water environment and we talked about the the investment for example that the water industry has made uh i think uh effective regulation depends on a number of things one is a clear and effective regulatory framework the other is the resources um to implement those regulations through inspection advice and where appropriate enforcement and the third is, is a mechanism for investing in the improvements that we wish to see. And I think where those things come together, you, you see the, the improvements that we, we have discussed. Now, uh, you know, we, we all live and work in the real world and, and there are pressures, financial pressures uh, on businesses and financial pressures on, on, on the public purse. So our responsibility within the Environment Agency is to use the resources that we have and to deliver the best environmental outcomes that we possibly can. But of course, like any organisation, uh, we need the resources to do that and we make the case for doing so. 
Now, part of our responsibility, I think, is also to look at ways in which we can operate more efficiently. And perhaps monitoring is an example of that, where you know we take perhaps a more risk-based approach than we used to. We look at those uh, rivers and water bodies where water quality is broadly uh, stable, and uh, we adjust and reduce our sampling accordingly and focus our effort and resources on those uh, uh, rivers and water bodies where we think the greatest risk is and where we think the water environment is changing. So, of course, we will always make the case for the resources that we need, uh, but we have an obligation to, uh, to work and, and innovate uh, and regulate in ever more efficient ways, which I hope we, we do. Are we toothless? I don't believe so. Uh, we take enforcement action where it's appropriate. And as I've said, you know, through our regulation, we've secured a lot of investment in the water environment, particularly with the water industry. And I think that is testimony to the work of the Environment Agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe to follow up on that, um, I would like to ask uh, the other panelists to um, give their view on um, yeah, how uh, the, uh, the Environment Agency is working for them, with them, and how their access to resources is affecting the, pro the projects. Can you have some comments on that, please? Maybe Richard, you can start with that. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I mean, we we work very closely with the the agency in in a number of ways, actually, both as a partner, but also um, you know where we where we need to get permits, etc. Et um, I think one of the impacts that we're seeing is is around monitoring, um, and so I think there, there there does need to be a there needs to be we we need to look at how we're monitoring to get the the, the data that we need and if the environment agency are, are not able to fund that and you know we all understand about um, cuts in funding then you know let's find another way with, within within the industry um, I think in terms of in terms of funding you know we're we're still seeing some funding coming through from the environment agency so that's maybe not having such an impact but I would I would definitely um, mention the uh that around the monitoring okay any of the other panelists who would like to say yeah i'll, I'll um go next and I, um, i'll just say yeah like richard we work very closely at natural england with the environment agency um obviously and um and have been affected you know in the past by similar austerity cuts and one thing that has been um you know if you like, like the, the good side, the, the silver lining, if you like, has been just the huge growth in the uh, NGO sector over the last 10 years as it sort of had to move in to fill a niche. Um, there's just, you know, the, the catch when I started off, I guess, gosh, well over 10 years ago now, there wasn't a catchment based approach. And now we have a Rivers Trust in every single catchment in the country almost. We have National Trust, we have, you know, we, we have. Um, the wildlife trust so and and and, and of course water companies and I, I think ruth's point about the fact that it's not just a single player here that the pressures on our mo i mean just the absolute scale of change that's needed the pressures on our systems are, are, are multiple and so yeah there's there's many players but i do think there is something for us all to reflect on and that's about being being as clear as possible um all of us about the scale of the problem and if we can all get really clear about the state of our freshwater environment and the and the um, you know what is needed in order to recover nature, I think that's uh, I think that's a really good place um, to, to to make the case really for, for why we need to respond to the desk up to review and and invest in our in our rivers. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Do you want to add something? I guess just just a quick question. Quick sort of response to that really is I mean monitoring data is very very important it doesn't all need to be collected by the environment agency it depends on the purpose of it there are some really good citizen science networks out there that can provide data there are opportunities to have you know real-time data collected through sensors um, in, in river providing instantaneous response so I think it depends what is the question that we're looking to answer and you know actually bearing in mind this might be a bit of an academic audience in, in places um, we don't necessarily need to be data snobs um, we can accept data from all sorts of different sources and bring it together to create a more comprehensive picture. 
as a water company, we do need robust data because we're spending millions of pounds of our customers' money and we need to ensure that it will deliver an environmental um, impact and change. But that's not universal. That's not the same as every sector. Um, so I think we, we need to be a bit more flexible around this. Okay, thank you. Um, what I would like to do is follow up on, on what uh, Rose was, was talking about, uh, that there are so many players in uh, uh, around, uh, well, uh, improving river, river water quality and, and, and so many players involved. One of the uh, players which I haven't uh, heard talking about, and I think Tom Arnott also mentioned that in his question, is uh, the, the, the role of farmers and landowners in, in the whole uh, discussion. Um, and um, yeah, I would like to ask you to, to, to comment on that. And also, um, if we are looking at uh, a process where so many uh, different uh, um, stakeholders are involved, who should take the lead in, uh, in this? Who is controlling it? Who is directing it? Um, could you answer that uh, for me, Rose? Yeah, yes, thank you. And, um... I think it's a good challenge. I mean, often water companies can be seen as almost easy targets or cash cows for, for solving this problem. Um, but as uh, Ruth you know, clearly pointed out, I mean, it, they're, they're not just the sole player here. I mean, yes, farmers and agriculture, I think um, uh, the agricultural sector is responsible for about a third of failures to meet good ecological status. Um, David, David will confirm that. Um, Partly, um, it wasn't the focus of this talk this evening, but I do think um, there's a, absolutely a clear role to play and the new um, environmental land management scheme will bring in um, under the sort of new sustainable farming incentive, there'll be new sort of rules and, and, and incentives around um, nutrients and buffer strips and, and livestock numbers and cover crops, all of those kind of practical on farm measures that can be um, you know, uh, protect water quality, but there's also um, scope under the, the sort of higher tier, um, I don't know if you call it higher tier anymore, but the, the local nature recovery, and the landscape recovery elements of ALMS, which will be really important for, for rivers and uh, rev river restoration. Um, but what I would really like to say on this is, it's so important that um, one, that we don't look at the sectors in isolation and tick them off one at a time. Um, you know, and it's not either or all. I mean, Ruth's got some great examples of where Wessex Water is working with farmers um, in, in their catchments uh, collaboratively. But also, it's really important that all of, you know, that we show leadership and we don't have a sort of race to the bottom in terms of it's not me, it's them kind of thing, but we all sort of step up because the scale of challenge is needed is that we all step up and um, and um, I think the, the water companies have and, and the regulators and, and government have a really important leadership role there. Okay, thank you. David, could you uh, give your view on this? Certainly. Um, well, uh, absolutely. 40% uh, of our uh, water bodies uh, are directly impacted by uh, pollution from rural uh, uh, areas and agriculture. So it is, it is clearly one of the most important pressures. Um, I also think, and as I said earlier, <clears throat> um, you, you know, in, in the case of uh, rural and urban pollution, a lot of that is diffuse. So it does require, I think, a holistic approach. Uh, I also think that the new environmental land management scheme offers a, a great opportunity and within the environment agency we are working closely with uh, with DEFRA and other colleagues across the, the, the DEFRA group uh, to develop and support the, the implementation of ELMS and we will be supporting the uh, national pilots. But I would also like to acknowledge that the, the leadership of the water companies and actually Wessex Water in particular, because I think there is a sort of a growing, you know, there are a number of things coming together here in terms of <clears throat> the importance of land management, um, protecting our rivers, but also uh, reducing the need for investment in new treatment works and, um, and treatment processes. So uh, dealing with some of these sources of pollution at source. Uh, I think has enormous benefit both in terms of the the river environment, but also some of the wider environmental challenges like you know mitigation of climate change. So I think the water industry has shown tremendous uh, leadership 
um, in, in this particular uh, um, uh, uh, challenge. Um, so yes, uh, agricultural farming, uh, you know, uh, an important pressure and, uh, and I think we have some great opportunities in front of us. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to use this opportunity perhaps to change the subject a little bit. Um, there's one or two questions um, which are related to the organization of the water sector. Uh, so one of the questions uh, comes from uh, Caroline Roberts. Uh, many of the issues relating to poor standards and rivers, uh, but not all, were apparent already in the 1970s or early, uh, earlier. And acute pollution incidents have reduced a little but been replaced by other pressures, uh, she is saying here. Given that the privatization was intended to address uh, this through uh, increased investment, have the water companies had sufficient long to respond? And is it now time to renationalize uh, the water sector in order to sort this out? Um, I see you smiling, Ruth. Maybe you would like to answer this. Yeah, um, yes, well, fair question. I wonder whether uh, renationalisation would deliver the, the results which you might expect and the level of investment which is needed, bearing in mind some of the previous conversations, perhaps about lack of resources and funding through the Environment Agency. So, you know, that is a question for public sector um, or for public sector organisations and com competing uh, sort of national budgets at the moment. I think probably uh, the initial privatisation model did provide a huge cash injection and ability to raise finance to deliver um, some significant engineering schemes. And there are undoubtedly some very real successes around that. I mean, bathing waters is absolutely one of those, as, as is sort of um, phosphorus removal um, and also sort of just general um, change, um, improvements in gross pollution. That doesn't mean to say that there isn't more to be done. And actually now probably where we are, it's sort of, it's not quite the, the marginal gains, but actually some of the technologies which are required to deliver the, the level of phosphorus removal, for example, which we need to do are significant. They're very, very um, expensive. I mean, typically at the moment we, we sort of, where we do have phosphorus removal at serious treatment works, we're removing 80% of the phosphorus load. That last sort of um, sort of 10 or 20% is, is actually incredibly expensive to deliver. And there are some economies of scale there. So I think probably it's maybe privatization and nationalization, perhaps that is that is one debate. I think what we do need is a change in regulation. I think um, our previous um, sort of legislative structure, particularly European directives, are very much in isolation and they look at a single issue and channel investment for that single issue. They're not holistic. And actually that is the focus that we need to, to, to uh, address moving forward, having more holistic and innovative regulation, which enables us to use money differently and invest in, in nature-based solutions and and work with partners i mean why should water companies deliver everything why can't we pay you know the rivers trust national trust whoever to deliver some more nature-based solutions on our behalf um, we don't have to go down that sort of civil engineering route and we might actually find some better results from doing so so i think yes it is a moment for change whether it's renationalization i don't know that's a different debate <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, then I would like to um, go back to, to the actual rivers uh, themselves. Um, I think uh, Richard showed us a great movie of uh, how you could uh, change uh, the riverbed by uh, filling up the uh, and, and le le let the, la the, the water uh, flow over the land. Um, there's a question here from uh, Jess Wire on the, on this uh, uh, list. Uh, how can we dissuade uh, people to answer to uh, river flooding uh, is, is dredging? How can we do that? Richard. Um, yeah, I think we are winning that battle. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think you, I think we've seen a I've seen a change with the um, you know recent flooding events, which you know are, are happening every year now. The debate changes each time. And whereas you know a couple of years ago it, it was always uh, you know we need to dredge, we need to dredge sort of cry. Where, whereas now and we're seeing seeing this uh, you know in the Lake District after Storm Desmond, where you know communities are actually realizing that. You know, it's it's not dredging. It's got to be another solution, and getting involved in the you know that holistic approach that Ruth has, has just um, de described, which I you know agree with co completely. So, I, I I sort of feel we've moved on from that, but we've we've got to keep going, and we've got to 
um, I think engage people with that holistic approach. You know, everybody lives in a catchment. Everybody um, relates to water. You know, we everybody uses water, and everybody, um, as I say, interacts with it. And we've 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 got to up our game game with that and get more people involved, more people caring. Um, and I think we will will keep winning. And I think the uh, I think the dredging brigade are you know hopefully receding. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think uh, as you say, uh, water is used by everyone, and we are uh, attracting more and more people to water. And, and I think Rose was uh, was talking about that in her first uh, 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 contribution to actually attract people to 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 the rivers and and use that uh, to uh, to to um create uh, positive uh, societal uh, uh, effects uh, from that but my question to rose is um if we are attracting so many people to the rivers uh, uh, and if we make the river accessible uh, isn't that contradictory to uh, creating the natural environment and and restoring the, the the rivers to a natural state could you comment on that yes um yes and i hear about this i mean the tension between recreation and wildlife um, and ecosystems and the impacts of recreational pressures. I mean, it's something particularly at the moment we're seeing across the board, you know, um, in terms of the wider countryside. So it's definitely something we need to be mindful of. What I would say is what we need, um, we need to sort of rewild our rivers and, and think about the sort of big changes that we can have in terms of, you know, Richard was just talking about you know, the potential to reconnect more rivers to the floodplain as, 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 as opposed to dredging. And there's space, if we make space for rivers, there's potentially space for people too and space for wildlife. I think the problem at the moment is, you know, literally rivers are squeezed into these little tiny channels and the people have hardly got any access. So it goes into sort of, um, you know, these sort of pressure points, if you like, where, there, where there, there's real tension. So I think it's really important to try and think big about this and think about how we can, you know, create more space for people but and nature. So it's not about competing with the little scraps of nature that we've got left. It's about, yeah, really thinking big and, and how we can uh, how we can change our, our um, uh, you know, and, and there'll be, how we can change that sort of wider catchment as well as just thinking about the channel and the, and the narrow small amount of uh you know buffer that there is at the moment okay thank you very much um yes unfortunately looking at the time uh, i think we uh, we have to uh, to wrap up there are still uh, quite a number of questions i think here in the chat um but uh yeah unfortunately we are already 15 minutes uh, past our uh initial time uh, schedule um i would like to thank uh, ruth david and richard and rose uh, for their time and such brilliant uh, presentations here this evening and thank uh, all of you for coming uh, to uh, to this and contributing to the discussion um as mentioned before, this session will be available as a podcast and uh, do take a look at the IPR website uh, also for upcoming events uh, over the next uh, few months. Um, so yes, I would like to, to thank you very much for being uh, here tonight. And uh, um, well, if you still have to go for dinner, uh, so enjoy your, uh, your meal uh, tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>